more of it at the noy rawi low exar, you know, especially are insane yell maybe new posting out lady. Now she is shove and hanging the mag like said the man shall gam he lay some bobes, low we were up yet toy mudi, shift the call me shantako and him in a tamuni, a rope for I shall con negative so roy, shant of a shaman roshin for Siri Boy, a to Kuniko in Hayoi, Shafty Bebes at the Noy the Oracle. Very first pasuk of this week's parsha is somewhat difficult. In the kukosai telechu, if you walk with my laws, mitzvosai tishmeru, you observe my mitzvos vas samosam, and you do them. It's very confusing. There's different languages for commandments in the pasuk. There's different verbs for keeping the mitzvos in the pasuk. The farshim say various things. I'd like to share with you what the sforno says on this pasuk. The Sforno says, if you walk with my laws, if you resolve to keep the mitzvot of Hashem, and you observe the mitzvot, it's not only that you've resolved to keep the mitzvot of Hashem, but you make it your business to do it right. You make sure to understand the appropriate halachos. You make sure to understand the appropriate intentions associated with those mitzvot. Then, then when you fulfill those mitzvahs, it will be with the spirit of Abba. It will be with the spirit of meaning, of affection for God, because you've invested yourself in the mitzvahs, you've resolved to do it, and you've resolved to do it right. People spend so much time trying to figure out today, how do I make religion meaningful for myself? How do I make Torah and mitzvot meaningful? How do I connect to it? What should I read? What should I think about? You know, I've known Dr. Jerry Terrigan, Yoshua Dov Ben Azriel, definitely over 30 years. And thinking about this in the last few days, I think he was a remarkable model this idea that the Sforno was presenting. You know, you know how he connected to Torah and Mitzvahs? He did it. He did it, and he made sure to do it right. And because he made sure to do it right, in just the right way, it meant a great deal to him. Just to give a few basic examples, I'm sure so many people here can give much better examples than what I'm going to give, but just a few basic examples. Davening. You know, I, I looked over last night to his spot in Shul. His son in law was sitting in his spot in Shul. It was very beautiful to see his son in law there. And I said to myself, of course, that was his spot in Shul. How many minyanim over all of these decades that we've had the Swiss to have Jerry Terrigan here showing up when he was supposed to show up, davening when he was supposed to daven in his spot? Was part of him. Study of Torah. He so, so appreciated his relationship with Ravain or Zechorn of Rahu. That was abundantly clear. If I'm not mistaken, he was a regular in Ravain or Zechorn back from the early days when he was here in the Shoal, I think as a graduate student, if I'm not mistaken. I remember as I guess a teenager seeing all these flyers around for dial of death. And that was Jerry Terrigan's thing, dial of death. You know what? It was before, it was before all the amazing seal mashases and where it was the in thing to do that. Jerry Terrigan did it. I had this listen, you'll hear, you'll hear later on this morning from this long time come from Sagat Willing. But I remember, I remember as a I can't remember if it was when I was in high school, I was already in Yeshiva Gadola. There's a fellow who, Jerry Terrigan was once approached. There's someone who would be good if you learned with him, you'll kind of teach him Torah. Other people started in this program. Other people did it a few months. Other people did it a year. Jerry Terrigan did it for years. And I remember, 
I, I just, you'll, you'll forgive me, uh, it's Glenn who's going to speak later. I was speaking to him on the phone yesterday, my, my, my apologies, Glenn, and he told me his name. The name meant nothing to me. I, mean, I apologize. But then he described the relationship, and I drew up his picture, his, the picture of his face in a moment. Because how many times did I see Jerry Terrigan learning with this person on uh, one night a week in the yeshiva? And it wasn't just that he was learning with him. There was a warmth. There was a pleasant bearing. And I want to say, as a yeshiva student, and I'm not talking about as a rabbi, as a yeshiva student in the community, I always felt such a great warmth from Dr. Terry. When he would see me, when he would greet me. Yes, I was friends with his son, but I, I always felt it was about more than that. Whether it be he saw me in, in the yeshiva, in the shul, whether it be I and other boys from the yeshiva were guests at his and his wife's home, which we definitely were guests at different shop meals over the years. There was always such a feeling, oh, we have a yeshiva students here. This is so nice. This is so special. You make sure to do the mitzvahs, and you make sure to do the mitzvahs right. You'll build a connection to the mitzvahs. And of course, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was all just a show. The greatest proof that it wasn't just a show is the beautiful mishpacha that we have sitting here. Four different children, nine hara, each built and building beautiful families in their own right. Torah did families, part of community. Where does that come from? That comes from a model. It's very, it's a very interesting thing. Um, I, I, uh, I've heard his son Mitch say this many, many times. People would ask Mitch how long, how long he knew Rabbi Einimer for. Mitch would respond with a number larger than the number of years he's lived in this world. And of course, he would receive a quizzical look and he would say, I've known Rabbi Einimer for the number of years that my father knew Rabbi Einimer. Because I've inherited that relationship with Rabbi Einimer. That's a spirit in the family. If we're talking about imparting a spirit of appreciation for Torah and mitzvahs to the family. How can we not reflect just as an outside observer, but I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of so many community members. How can we not reflect on the beautiful expression of warmth that we so often saw between Dr. Terrigan and particularly his grandchildren. I was reflecting how many times Ask yourself, community members, how many times over the last number of years, unfortunately not in the most recent years, how many times did you see Jerry Terrigan walking down Arcola pushing a stroller? How many times did you see him in the park with a grandchild? And did it look like there was anything in the world you would rather have been doing? And so in, his, in a beautiful life, he lived with a passion for Torah and Mitzvahs. He lived with a tremendous love of family. Baruch Hashem, it, it continues. There, he has great grandchildren today tonight. Of course, all of this beautiful life and achievements that we reflect on were done as part of a team. Tzibar Lechayim, his wonderful, wonderful wife did this together with him. And all of us look with great admiration, not only for the beautiful home they built together, but the almost unbelievable dedication she's had in these past years. And it's something that surely every member of the family learns from. And so many of the rest of us have learned a tremendous deal from it. It's been, it's been very difficult to see and to hear what has been with Dr. Terrigan over the last months and indeed years. And I think the feeling in many ways, I'm speaking for myself, but I think the feeling in many ways is that passionate neshama 
was somewhat trapped in, in, in a body in which he couldn't quite express things and do things the way he would have liked. And with terribly sorry to lose him from this world, but he has to move on to the next world. His neshama is not constricted. I can't get on to spirit club, so Joe. Not today. Is, is I'll to work on Sunday, okay? May I'm soul listening. Be be bound in the bonds of life. And of course, if you just think about that on a very surface level, it's a little bit difficult to understand the bonds of life. What do you mean? He's, he's gone. He's not living. So, of course, it means eternal life. But in a sense, I, 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 think, I think the Brahma is particularly meaningful for this very, very special person who tragically was so limited in recent times that now his neshama taps in to this chayim, even purer, even more special than he was able to experience, certainly in recent times. May he always made his tremendous example be a remarkable beacon for Doros that he set together with his wife in such a beautiful path. And may there be much, much in common for his family and much in common so many others who have learned much from him. David Terry. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. And thank you all for coming. This has been a difficult journey for my father and our family. An almost four year rupture of life as we knew it, and a change for my father that was painful to watch and observe. <clears throat> the end comes not as a surprise, as was ultimately expected, only the timing was unknown. We changed how we interacted with my father from talking with him to talking about him. Yes, we could talk to him, but he wouldn't often respond. But now we can only talk about him in a way that is both sad, but heartwarming, as we recall the positive aspects of his life before this devastating illness took him away. In the next few moments, I hope to share some of those positive memories of his life. The Gemara in Ketubos, Daf Samach Bet Amralaf 62a, discusses an interesting incident in which a, a Jew is walking with an Ovid Kofavim. The Jew is walking ahead, the Ovid Kofavim wants to stop him. So the Ovid Kofavim tells him that you know, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. The Gemara is trying to prove a point that if you tell someone some bad news, they, they break and they stop. But the Jew kept going and he didn't respond. And the Ovid Kofavim stopped him and said, why aren't you stopping? And he said, this is, this is not, this is, I've been warning for years. This is not expect. This is not shocking. Take notice. This. this is how I feel. We've been warning for the last four years. It's not a surprise, but it's still sad, and we'll continue to mourn going forward. When I think about the last few years, it really hurts to think of the time lost in his relationship with his wife, his four children, and their spouses, twelve grandchildren, and three great grandchildren, some of whom he never really met in a meaningful way. Rabbi Weinberg recently. Was discussing something from Rav Mursky and his Sefer Hegyone Halacha, citing from Rav Meir Shapiro, that the Kaddish really, you know, we say Kaddish for, for when someone has, has died, but Kaddish doesn't mention the dead or the deceased. But the purpose of Kaddish is to Makadish Hashem. The, the deceased person, my father, can no longer Makadish Hashem, which was the, the pride of his life. And we say Kaddish to sort of make up for that. In, in the last in the last four years, it's sad to think that my father was not able to accomplish Hashem in the way he was used to. It's heartbreaking, but hopefully going forward, we can make up for that in our learning and with our cottage. My father was a great man. He was born in Baltimore in 1940 and later moved to, to Washington with his family when his father took a job with the federal government as a civil engineer. He attended the Hebrew Academy, uh, now Berman, and he went to TA in Baltimore for high school. He learned in Mary Sorrell before attending college in Georgetown. So he was always proud to say that he never graduated college because he went from Georgetown to the dental school without graduating. He, he went to dental school at University of Maryland and he specifically chose that over Georgetown because Georgetown had clinics on Shabbos and the University of Maryland did not. After serving two years in the army during Vietnam, he eventually settled here in Silver Spring and opened his dental practice 
where he worked until he retired in 2009. His life was devoted to many things, but as Rabbi Rosenbaum said, he, he made learning and davening a major priority. He had a very long relationship with Rabbi Amr, as you heard, attending his Wednesday night Gemara for many, many years. He learned with him back even before he was married. Rabbi Amr was in the Sada tradition at my parents' wedding. He also began learning Dafyomi long before it was fashionable and popular, and he completed Shas at least <coughs> three to four times until he was unable. I, I've lost track how many times he completed Shas. He was the point person, as Rabbi Rosenbaum said, for Daf, dial a Daf, which was you know pre-internet, the way people would get Dafyomi shearing, they would dial a number, and if the tapes weren't working or someone wanted to subscribe, they, they'd call my father. My father was very medactic, or some would say OCD, and he was often very, a few pages ahead of the doc, just so he wouldn't fall behind. <laughs> he had a long starting, as you heard, he had a long standing weekly learning appointment with his Stavrusa of 26 years, Glenn Farber, who was here. And um, I, in fact, intended uh, several of their siyumim that they made on several of the that they learned over the years. And Glenn, I, I want to thank you for all the support and the friendship and the learning that you did with my father. And even in the last years, Glenn, every place my father was in five hospitals in Montgomery County over the last few years of nursing homes and home. Glenn was always there to visit. I was always meeting Glenn in the hospital. And I just want to thank you, Glenn, for all your support. As kids, my, my siblings and I would roll our eyes at our father's insistence that we not finish dinner without learning a daily Mishnah or two. We, we had this, we had, we had this subscription sort of, it was a, a, a mailer that would come in the mail and it would have a, a Mishnah and, the, and a commentary and we would take turns reading it and explaining it. And we all joke, you know, every every day we would read, it was written by Rabbi Elijah Michael Weiss, <laughs> Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This small part of our day was so important because it really had the intended effect of cementing a daily consistent devotion to learning and making that a regular part of our day, which clearly was his intention. <laughs> his devotion extended to davening as Rabbi I was upset. He, he consistently attended. He'd been young him here for many, many years, really, rarely missing a minion until he was unable. I have very, very fond, uh, many, many fond memories of sitting next to him in Shul upstairs and even on University Boulevard in the old days and in the house. Apart from Davening, he was very connected to this building, not just spiritually, but physically. When this building was built in the 1970s, he would spend his lunch break coming and surveying and monitoring the progress of the construction, making sure things were done correctly. He knew this building better than anybody else. In fact, he became the unofficial sort of engineer. And when things would go wrong, they would ask him, what do you think is wrong? He would set the timers and the lights before Shabbos, turn them off after Shabbos. And the, the, the clocks always went on time. If there was something that was wrong, if the light went off, it wasn't his fault, it was some glitch in the system. <laughs> he also prepared the, the yearly seating charts for the young and the Ryan. And, you know, my siblings could, could remember every year we would see the, you know, Oak Tag, we used to call it, or, you know, poster board coming in the house. And that was his activity. Tish above afternoon. He would freehand make these charts in his meticulous handwriting and drafting skills. And he would do that every year. In his, in his dental office, he loved working and seeing patients and talking to them about their families. Especially when children would come in, he would jokingly call them names like Sam or Bob or George, and they would always laugh to the point that these kids would come up to him in shoal or in the pool, and they'd say, hi, George, hi, Sam, and they'd laugh and run away. <laughs> he was known as an honest, fair dentist that really cared for his patients, often making emergency, receiving emergency phone calls on off days or in the evening and say, come right over, I'll look, I'll look at your, your teeth. He would have some Sunday morning hours just to accommodate people. Who, can, who did not want to take off work. I consistently and often hear from my patients when they hear my name and ask, oh, you're related to the dentist, Dr. Terrigan, with his office in Kent Mill? And I say, yes, he's my father. And they have a broad smile. And they, they, they say they loved having him as a dentist and they can't find anybody comparable to replace him. My father was also known to have lower fees than many. And some of that was due to his minimal overhead. You know, he had the office in the house. He didn't have rent to pay. He could have raised his fees, but he felt strongly that there was no, re no reason to gouge his patients by raising fees just because he could. We often asked him about this because it was known. He said, why don't you raise your fees? And he would say, is there something you don't have? Is there something you're lacking? Why should I do that? He was really so mad the Falco. He really, it made him proud to support his family, send us all to college, 
medical school, graduate school, with that student loans. That, that was his, you know, he was happy. He did not need luxury. And I often kid my parents about the cars they kept for way longer than most. <laughs> but he knew what was important. And I think that really taught us all a lesson. He did like, like things, he liked technology. He built our first color TV by hand, a kid. We also had one of the first computers, the Radio Shack TRS-80. You had to type in the type in the programs, or you had to use a cassette tape. It didn't really do much, but it was fun, it was tech. He also had his you know, devoted Miata. He was very devoted to his family, his wife, his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and we had lots of fun. I fond fondly recall serving with him as a crew in several sailing races in the Chesapeake Bay several times, some of which we won. I also recall our, our scuba diving trips in Miami where we became certified and later in the Cayman Islands. In fact, some of those diving pictures that we took were hanging on the wall next to his hospital bed in his, in his house. And there were bike rides, lots of bike rides, bike rides to play tennis, bike rides to his cousins in Woodside. We would bike ride on Sunday, we'd bike ride after school or camp. It was the highlight of my day to come home from school and go bike riding with my dad in the, in the spring and summer. Dad, I want to ask what feeling from you for anything I did that was hurtful or disrespectful, especially in the last several years as you dealt with this devastating series of medical issues. I'm especially sorry that I did not have the answers as a medical person in the family, both the ones you asked me early on and later on as things progressed and the family asked me to explain things and I just could not. I could not explain why he wasn't getting better. The, the family wants to thank all my father's aides, including Samuel and his boys, the guys, Desmond, Lewis, Martin, and most recently, Lakika. I really want to thank Rabbi Weinberg and Rabbi Rosenbaum for their kindness, support, and guidance over the last several years, and especially these last few weeks. And last but not least, my incredible mother, who acted with, with such strength throughout this entire ordeal and really served as a primary caregiver to make my father comfortable and coordinate his medical care and all of his needs. She really has been a rock through this. She had the foresight to take him out of the nursing facility in early 2020, just before the before anybody knew what Corona was. She took him out of the nursing home. And thankfully she did. He had another you know, two years. Thank you, Mom, for all you have done and all you do. Dad, I will really miss you. It is a proper room. With the garden. Dad, where do I start? You are the best of the best. Thank you for all that you have done for our whole family. Family was so important to you. Our family looked so forward to spending Pesach with the whole family. We are so grateful that just six weeks ago, we spent Pesach in New Jersey with almost all of us together. All the time, mom spent making arrangements for a bed, a caretaker, a van, and dialysis. It was well worth it when we asked you if you enjoyed having the whole family together again for Pesach and you nodded your head yes. You loved calling me Leah Cyril, Linda Sharon. I was fortunate to be named after your mother's mother. I hope that I came close to meeting your expectations for my namesake. Growing up with you, working in the basement, meant that you were always home. We never even carried a house key because we just went to the office if mom wasn't home. We were so fortunate to sit as a family every night and eat dinner together even though we consistently fought about where we would sit and no one wanted the bench. We treasured our after dinner bike rides to the baseball game. Although I have to say, the time when you put me on the handlebar of the bicycle and I got stuck in the wheel and I went flying was not one of the highlights of my youth. I still have a scar to show for it. You were a fabulous dentist. You love calling all the kids, Sam, Bob, George, and of course, Big Bird. 
You were kind and gentle and always made your patients comfortable with your calm demeanor and good sense of humor. As a teenager, I was so fortunate to be able to work in your dental office as your assistant. You taught me how to mix the fillings and develop the x-rays. It was great bonding. We always knew you wished that one of your grandchildren would become a dentist. The oldest, Jonathan, did consider it, but then changed his mind. There's always hope for the next generation. You taught us the importance of keyboard abayim. The amount of respect and care you showed your parents and in-laws equally was inspirational. It is my goal to best, it is my, my goal to try my best to follow your example in this regard. This show was so important to you. You were always the first in show and always the last to leave after you locked the doors. You were so involved. I remember every Tisha B'Av, you spent the whole afternoon making this new chart for Rosh Hashanah and your kibble. When I got married to Michael, you treated him as one of your children and Michael loved you like a father. You taught us so many valuable lessons, life lessons, and we are striving to accomplish even a fraction of what you were able to accomplish. This includes all the financial knowledge and life knowledge. It also includes the realization that if you were in the oven, you'd be hot too. And if you were in the freezer, you'd be cold too. But the most important thing that you taught us, and especially Michael, is that it is totally acceptable and encouraged to eat baked goods out of the freezer. Even if you're not, if you're, even if you're going to crack your wife's container to practically finish all of them. When we had Jonathan, you became a Zadie. And what a Zadie you were to Jonathan, Jennifer, Danielle, and all of your grandchildren. Your favorite expression was, if I knew having grandchildren would be so much fun, I would have had them first. <laughs> you loved all of your grandchildren more than life itself. You were the happiest when one or two or three or even all of them were climbing all over you. All you ever wanted to do was sit on the floor and play with them. You were even happier when one of them needed a clean, fresh diaper. You enjoy changing diapers more than anyone else I know. You love taking all of all 12 grandchildren to the slide park and taking them on the train. For you, even more fun was taking them swimming. Baruch Hashem, you were so glad to live this to live to see the birth of three great grandchildren over the last four years. While you weren't able to take them to the park, I truly believe you were aware of their presence and loved them just the same. In recent years, you were so concerned about my career and the long hours I worked, you tried to encourage me to find a new job and would call often to ask about progress. You loved going to the gym and we would compare what machines we used. Mom, you are truly inspirational. You are always a shining example of how to be a great wife, but the way you took care of dad the last several years is truly remarkable. There was nothing you didn't do for his comfort or care. To think that you brought him home right before COVID started was a miracle. You obviously can predict the future. On behalf of all my siblings, thank you for doing all it all to make this life as comfortable as possible. I also want to publicly thank my husband, Michael, for being the best son of all. The countless hours, days, and Shabbosim that we traveled to Maryland to spend Shabbos with him in the several hospitals he was in, and the nursing home truly shows the extreme dedication. We literally lived out of a suitcase for well over a year. Michael. Thank you. And I know, sorry. I want to give Akara the tone to the aides, Morton, Desmond, and Leckie, who took wonderful care of my father at home for the last two and a half years, seeing to his needs and being kind and gentle. I want to give Akara the tone to the entire ICU department in Holy Cross. The doctors and nurses were gentle, caring, 
and patient you took amazing care of my father over the last four weeks. <laughs> Lastly, Dad, I want to ask one thing if anything I have done. I love you so much, and I'm going to miss you time. I started by thinking my mom for I mean, nearly 50 years of devotion and love, especially the last few difficult ones. My dad, my dad definitely gave her a run for her money. Thank you, mom. My dad was born in Baltimore in 1940. Moved to DC shortly after after my father's my grandfather's position in the Department of Transportation. Dad attended the Hebrew Academy Great Washington Elementary School, which is located in Georgetown, many buildings ago. For high school, dad attended the Musical Academy in Baltimore with a proud valedictorian of his class of 1957, ahead of his very accomplished classmates, he took Siegel and Murphy Bowman Miller. Dad then learned a year of Snary Straw before heading to Georgetown University for college. He had the privilege there to sit next to Paul Tagliabu. Then Hoy is basketball star and former commissioner of the NFL since they sat in up but a quarter. Dad didn't graduate from Georgetown. I was always proud to identify as a college dropout. Back then, he just needed three requisites to get into dental school. Dad started dental school with his cousin Herbie, University of Maryland, Baltimore, in the fall of 1960. After his first year in summer of 61, Dad went to camp to work, a sleepaway camp, for his first time, Mara Mom, a very experienced camper. June of 64 was very busy for my parents. Mom graduated to start college, dad graduated from dental school, and on June 23rd, they married in Brooklyn. Dad was drafted as a captain in the army, so they packed up their belongings and headed down to Texas by way of my Toronto and Michigan, of course, for basic training in San, Fort San Houston and San Antonio. Then my parents were stationed in Fort Dix, New Jersey, for two years of military service. While there, they became parents when my brother showed up, so they reminded, they reminded us often he didn't cost too much. After discharge from the army, they moved here in the summer of 1966. They purchased, they purchased their current home, then only a construction site, 15 minute walk from the old Shomer University. In the early 70s, after my two sisters were born, my parents were one of 10 families who donated money to buy the old house that was on this site where we are sitting today. My dad was the sidewalk superintendent of the new building, visiting the construction site during his lunch break each and every day. This building opened in the fall of 1974, just before my parents achieved perfection when their baby arrived. <laughs> I was the second brace in this building. My dad was the ball at my brace, as well as the ball for my two sons. Dad was the unofficial Shabbos of the show for many years, setting the AC and the Shabbos clocks and dealing with everyone's complaints, especially on Shabbos Yonte, but he couldn't do anything about it. March of 1993, my dad adopted his old man. He became his baby. I just said he's 80, but the best one around. I mean, they have to be to change the baby's diaper. For him, it was a pleasure and an opportunity to kiss a belly. My kids always love spending time with my dad, and I was so jealous of all of them. My dad was dad with holy thoughts, and if he knew my grandchildren were so good, he would have had them first. Right now, I can just imagine that he's reuniting with his show buddies, Matt, Mel, Neil, and Sydney, enjoying the making sheer of labor. Learning was such an integral part of my dad's life, but there was his multiple work. Cycles through Young Filmy, his Monday evenings with Glenn, where Vandenberg's Wednesday night she could march here. My dad had the of knowing and learning from Vandenberg for more years than he knew his own father. I would like to, thank, I would like to personally thank Fort Sadiq and the front of the power last night, Max Rodman, Bill Ginsburg, and Nechemi Manelli Bergman. I want to thank everyone who has visited, helped, and reached out over the past two years. I thank my dad for his influence in my sports fandom. We had the privilege in attending events in all sports together. First, he was taking me, then I was taking him with my kids. Even recently, my dad always explained so easily why the Redskins have lost. He would just tell me that the other team had four points. <laughs> Nowadays, everyone tells me I look like my dad, walk like my dad, sound like my dad, and even tell jokes like my dad. And that could not make me any proud. I've always enjoyed being identified as Jerry's son. Dad, I love you, and I hope you forgive me for being the most challenging prodigy. I'll keep mowing your lawn. Hey, Tan Barrison. Hey, 
Zaidi, 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 as we all affectionately called it. Almost 30 years ago, I became part of the family, but I felt like a son. He brought me in, he always welcomed me, he always treated me just like anyone else in the family. I'm, I'm gonna probably repeat a lot of what's already been said, but it's amazing how an individual can make everybody feel comfortable. As it was said, I, I think all three children, he loved to call everybody a silly name. Some of it might've been because he didn't always remember everybody's name, but I think it was to lighten the mood. It was to make everybody feel comfortable. Everybody, when he was there if, around them, they all felt comfortable. As David said, people would come just to hear that silly name. For many, many years, my son is almost 29 years. He would come every single Thursday night to be part of our family, to take my children to dinner, to spend time with their, his grandchildren. As everybody already said, that his grandchildren was his life. I can only ask that I can be a grandfather like that to my grandchildren. It is amazing. I, I have heard, I've seen texts I've, I've, over the last few days of, we knew it was Thursday night because Zadie's green Miata was in front of the house. And it was, it was there, it was his time. It was his time with his grandchildren. I also want to say that um, the, the amazement of his learning was well beyond uh, what has already been said. When I first became part of the family, I would come to the house and he was always in the den, sitting there listening to the Dalai Dot. Again, I, I forgive, forgive me for repeating things, but this is what has uh, given me the strength to do this over the last few years. I don't wanna correct the people in front of me, but I think he did the cycle five times. I remember he used to mark it off. I believe he finished it five times. Uh, I tried. I tried when I first became part of the family to start it. I couldn't finish the cycle. I am now finished, getting close to finishing my second cycle because I started in the middle of the last, uh, you know, the prior go around. But a lot of it comes from what he did, how he was. He took everybody as, you know, important. There was nothing. He was a quiet man. He didn't ask for COVID, he didn't look for COVID. Everything he did was behind the scenes. There are many things that I don't know that people don't know that he just did. Um, I, I've had people come and tell me this over the years. Your father-in-law is exceptional. 25 years ago, he did this, or I was a patient at his dental office and he took care of me, as David said, he took care of me in the middle of the night, on a Sunday, whenever. As the years went on and he started to uh, retire from his practice, he got to come more often to us. And people don't know, I tried to give him his space because that was Zadie's time. Zadie wanted that time with his grandchildren, loved that time with his grandchildren, and there was nothing more important than that time. We are in the middle of, uh, uh, we're finishing this week's Parsha and we're finishing Seder. Etc. of the, the homage. And to me, I think about this and it's a, it's a chapter, we're closing. We're, we're finishing a chapter now. But when you finish the chapter, we say, chazak, chazak, benit chazek. This is what Zaidi taught all of us. We have to go from one thing to the next, to be strong, to take whatever you do, your learning, your, your, your excitement in whatever you do, you have to take it to the next level. I asked Mechila for myself, for my wife, for my children, Zadie, for anything you might have done over the years. I know I maybe not was not always the best son-in-law, but I always tried hard. And I know you love me just like a son. This is this is very hard on me because he treated me 
like I say, as a son, Jonathan Darby. <clears throat> I first <clears throat> want to thank Hashem. It's not often that someone <clears throat> has 29 years of uh, amazing numbers with grandparents. I know I speak for all, all the grandchildren and great grandchildren, but boy, I just feel lucky. I know it's been mentioned the love and dedication that you show your grandchildren. I always wished that we lived a little closer so that we could participate in the Thursday night pizza. <laughs> But, but in a way, I always appreciated the distance. I always asked you if you could bring your Miata to East Brunswick so that I can get rides. And of course you brought it, despite the distance and the size, the terrible mile per gallon. I always look forward to coming to Silver Spring basically every month for years to get my orthodontist work. And no, it wasn't just because I got to skip day of school. And they wonder if I subconsciously didn't wear my retainers in between my three different sets of braces. <laughs> just, just that I would be able to come and get one night a month by myself with you and with Bobby. I miss those rides when I would come in the downstairs dental chair that used to give me every time I came. Your dedication to going to Minion that was discussed and going on time and singing as Miros and learning not the only with those tapes was truly inspiring for me. And I always loved going to Minion with you. And when I was younger, and I didn't know when it was time to sit down, and you would tickle the back of my knees. <laughs> so I would sit. I will always remember your incredible sense of humor. Good morning, Zadie. How'd you sleep? Lying down with my eyes closed. <laughs> or, when, or when you would take my hand and use it as a shaver to shave your beard or scruff that was on your face. Or when you would ask us why we needed our smartphones. <laughs> And it would promptly flip, take out your flip phone and show us your two apps. <laughs> or when you would take one look at my note oh, on my feet and want to make sure that I only paid half price <laughs> because the back was missing. <laughs> or when you were buying me my fill in and asked if I had any requests. And when I told you, I didn't want the red boxes. You would proceed to always point out every single red box anytime we were in school together. <laughs> From when I was 11 all the way until you bought me my black box. <laughs> or when you would make fun of me for asking if we could drive to shore for toppers. <laughs> Probably our longest running joke between the two of us. Me asking if we could drive, and you saying we're gonna walk. I'm sorry, Zadie. I'm so always, I'm sorry for always finishing the boxes of cereal <laughs> in your cabinet every single time I came here. I'm 
sorry for always blaming you for the crap containers in the freezer, <laughs> holding cookies in my parents' house. <laughs> Mommy, it still wasn't made, it was the box. <laughs> I will always remember one of the last full phone conversations we had. It was on your birthday four years ago. You were in the hospital. I called to wish you a happy birthday. And you told me that you had gotten up and fallen down and then your hip was hurting you. And I asked you where you were going when you fell. And you said you were hungry. And I'm sure you were on your way to go get one of those cookies <laughs> or some chocolate ice cream from the fridge. Thank you, Zayden. Thank you for always being there for me. My sisters, all the cousins. Thank you for showing such incredible love towards Liz. You've done the family as if you were one of your own grandchildren. I hope I can emulate everything that you have taught me in my 29 years of you and can be there for Gavi and all of our future children and grandchildren and your children like you were there for yours. I love you, Zadie. I already miss you more. More than you can imagine. So I, I've said for years, I feel very spoiled. I got I got to have my grandfather he live in the same town with me. But he came down every week growing up. That was every Thursday we talked we've been talked about already. But that was that so it was it was something that it, it was something that was I, I didn't think about growing up, I didn't think about how lucky I was, how lucky I was that to have him in my house every week. And it wasn't, it was of course to play with us, but things like doing homework with me, learning with me, pushing me to to, to learn better. Um the example I place we've already heard from everybody about how about the Dafio me. It was it was incredible watching it. I didn't see I didn't often see, I mean, my father learns plenty, but the, the dedication he had when this wasn't a thing. Nowadays, everybody had the, the, their listening to a podcast, their, their listening to a share. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that 20, 25 years ago. Um, the, getting communion on time, that's something that like, I have to apologize to Zadie. It's a standard that I, I didn't always uphold. And, <laughs> and the disappointment for you, it was just, it wasn't a, it wasn't your upset. It was like, how, how could you not make communion on time? Like, that's not, it wasn't. This, this is impossible. Right? The concept of not making a community on campus. What do you? What is that? And so, yeah, I want to ask Matilda for, for that for disappointing you for not upholding upholding the standard there. And I, I hope I can I can I can uh, meet that standard for the rest of my life. Um, it's one of the maybe the, up there in one of the greatest moments of my life was which was Zadie holding my daughter for the first time. I, I feel so so lucky, it's such a bracha that I got that opportunity. Obviously, he didn't get to to dote on her the same way he doted on me, my, my siblings, my cousins. But just the, the love in his eyes, holding a great grandchild, was just no. There's no nothing like that. I just I, I think I, I can't I can't be grateful enough to Hashem for all the time I got to spend with him, with my puppy as well. Them in Baltimore, but been there every every week. It was it, a week that he wasn't there, or something was wrong. I, I just felt off. What, what are we going to do? It's Thursday and Zadie's not here. And then Sunday, we wanted to come swimming. We came to Silver Spring. A summer, I went to camp here. I was always getting a ride home with him. I remember going back to preschool, getting picked up in his Miata. He let me play with the roof, even if it was 40 degrees outside. Okay, fine. You can put the roof down. You can put it right back up. You can put it down. Um, coming here, I even, I even moved into my grandparents' house for a few weeks in the summer when I was, when I was a teenager. It, just, it, was like, it was like my house. And then, then I met Miriam, and immediately she was part of the family. And immediately, the same thing with, with we think it's a, a granddaughter-in-law, not, not somebody who, but just, she was part of the family. She came for Shabbos meals, when we were dating, she hung out with us on Pesach, um, and, and just welcomed me in. They, they, 
just the warmth of the family. And every time I came, he wanted me to, to sing a zemmer that he didn't know. He really wanted to sing a zemmer that he didn't know, but then you know, sing that tune that I don't know so I can, so I can learn it. Just I, I I feel so lucky that I, that we had that I had so much time with you and so much closeness with you. I I I I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to be, how I can be thankful enough to you and to Bobby for, for everything. So, thank you. And like I said before, I hope I can live up to your standard. Uh, there's, there's nothing like that village that you should. There's a job that we learning. This is probably well. Uh, Some of yours, huh? Growing up, my favorite day of the week was Thursday. Every Thursday, my favorite week, and everybody knew it. Um, there's a famous story that I only know from the famous story that Baby would repeat to me all the time. One Thursday, he came picking up when I was three years old from school, and I would come running to him. I came running screaming, My baby, my baby. And I, that's just Everybody knew how much I loved my baby. Um, when I was in elementary school, I took the bus and on Thursday, driving back, when we came to the house, the brush driver would see the green Liana and you announce to the bus, Grandpa is here. <laughs> Just everybody knew how much I loved my time spending with baby. On Thursday, I came home. He would be there and he would always start with helping with my homework. I remember hours spending of him testing me on my spelling test. Um, and he could not play until I knew all my spelling words. But afterwards, he would play for hours, the amount of games that he gave me, take with him, or outside playing catch, or me interrupting my brother and playing play catch and being a reindeer with sticks. I apologize, Aidy, for doing that, but those memories are how long it's had for me. And as always, toe pizza on Thursday night, and we couldn't end the night without Zadie getting his Rita's chocolate chocolate misto shake every single week. I just have countless stories of these uh, with Zadie, and I, I can't spend, I can spend her hours talking about them. And just being downstairs and the office when we were kids, coming here, getting the lives in the chair, so meaningful. And I am so thankful to you and love you that when I approached you four years ago, my creative idea to turn the department into a, the, the office into an apartment, um, I, I'm so thankful that I've been able to have the last four years to be so close and spend so much time with you. You are so generous and allowed me to basically take your office and turn it into my own space. So thank you. Last, um, on days off, it, it really, I, I mean, the past few years, it's been very hard to understand what's going through your head. But when I came up to you and asked me, days off, are you okay? You shook your head and smiled. And it, it, I can really tell, I can see that he was, it was so meaningful and that he knew understood somehow that we were all going to spend a long place out with him. And he, it was just so meaningful that he could spend a long place with him. I just wanted to say thank you. And I, I really cherish the privilege I've had to spend so much time with you. And we uh, love you. Jennifer Garvey. Ray was the best man and even better than me. Barbara Jam, I was so fortunate to have spent 26 years of my life from him, with him, to learn from him, and countless hours with him. And there's so many amazing memories I will have with me forever. 
Even though we don't live so much more, I'm fortunate to have seen my family and baby many times every year. All we want these now, Shabuas at our girls' child town. So I guess many times I guess and other various times for family talk out or dentist appointments every month. My parents used to go away every year and leave us. And while I was very sad when they left, I was very excited because it meant that Bobby and Bailey would be coming to spend the my house with us. I spent a few summers at Camp Bobby and Bailey. I went to Shoreditch during the day, and at night we would do night activities. We had a very good system on it. Zane and I used to go bike riding in the park and watch little league games, and we would go baseball games together. Every Tuesday was fish day, it means that you're very picky. And but we used to try and get us to try it. Because Zane and I would always look at each other and say, Yeah, for me, pasta. <laughs> he was always a jokester, and he always knew how to make us laugh. We used to use our hands as shapers, and he had us on our lap. Whenever he had a beard or some scrub that he had shaped yet. He never wanted to get a smartphone, even we all had them. And he used to tell us that his flip phone had two apps a calling app and a texting app. And whenever we were in clothing or shoes that had holes in it, like, you know, not with sandals, he used to ask us if we'd have clothes for that. I also, I, I don't know how this started, but somehow Zadie became, became known as a troublemaker. And I would used to always send it to the corner whenever he was acting out. He had the shirt that he always used to wear. That said, if I knew how great grandchildren were, I would, I would have had them first. And that was my baby. He always had the biggest smile on his face when he was with his grandchildren. Like when he was with Tom, he saw, or swimming with all of us in the pool. He loved his grandchildren so much, and he was such a role model to all of us. <coughs> I remember as a kid, whenever we were in there with Chavez, he was always sitting in the same seat at the table. And I think it was Chavez morning or afternoon. He would always be reading Karashina for a pamphlet. And as a little kid, I, I, know what that was. You know, I, I always wondered why I was writing a pamphlet with pictures of animals in it. And I never had a heart to stop him and ask him what he was doing. So I just sat there and watched him. Every time I meet someone new from Silver Spring, and it happens a lot, I always ask them if they go Tarragon. Most people remember Dr. Tarragon in the corner house with the office in his basement because he was their dentist. And that speaks so much to a dentist who goes to his patients. He never took a vacation except for a case off of family time. And he devoted himself to his patients and never made them wait for him. As a future physician, this is the kind of doctor that I love him. Completely devoted to my patients, and my patients remember me five years later. I know that while he won't be here physically for all the big moments coming up, I know that he will be with me when I got a graduate medical school. And when I got willing to get married, all my, all my cousins, and every other moment, and I know that he will be proud and smiling down at me and all of us. And I know that everything he taught me, for example, and work will help guide me for the rest of my life. And of course, one of the most important lessons he taught me and all of us is how good could be at the freezer cases. <laughs> I'm Neil Gardner. Thank you so much for all the memories that we got together. For some reason, there's this one story that absolutely won't leave my, my head. And I think I know why. And just like my sister, I had the privilege of spending many summers in Bowman Zadie camp. And I remember one summer, Lisa and I decided that we wanted to go on a bike ride. And so you sent us one of us in Bobby's bike and one of us in your bike. And I remember very clearly, you and I had like three miles in 15 minutes, and we were so proud of ourselves. Except with a few minutes left, the chain on Zadie's bike snapped. And of course, we had to go home and we showed them that the bike snapped. And of course, Zadie wasn't so happy with us. But I know that if you down, he wouldn't have enjoyed having his bike snapped by anyone more than his grandchildren. It probably brought him so much sympathy for his bike to be broken by his grandchildren who are doing nothing other than bike riding his bike down the street. Like my mom mentioned, when I was in 12th grade, we spent 
Thank you so much for coming down here to spend. And I had the privilege of spending time in the house with Bobby, which was absolutely amazing. But I remember he wasn't really he was so great at the time. And then I disappeared as a camp for about 10 weeks. When I came back, you were a completely, completely different person. And for our first time, I have so many amazing memories, and one that has inspired me ever since that day. It was Parsha Ra'e that shot this. I remember so clearly. And I went to the kitchen asking if you wanted to learn with me. And you said yes. And so I went to bring out the lunch. And I started reading the script. And back then, the Hebrew wasn't as good as it is now. And I read a post that I had no idea what it meant. And without you reading the Pesach, just simply hearing you say it, you then proceeded to translate the Pesach and explain to you the Pesach and what it meant. And from that moment on, I, I, it was because you were so dedicated to your winning, it's so dedicated to your going, but you remember the random Pesach in Parsha of A, and you knew exactly what it meant. And then a few months later, when I went for John Olive, it was that moment that really inspired me and continued to inspire me to learn the way that I do and the way that I've been able to do. And I know that you've also inspired my father to learn that, which has also inspired me. I started that year to learn not from me because you taught me how important it was to learn every single day and to be consistent with your learning and to be so passionate the way that you were. Of course, that summer we also had ice cream parties, which we've always had my entire life. And I, for sure, am obsessed with ice cream the way that I am because of you. And of course, like everybody else nowadays, in my apartment, my roommates get mad at me all the time because I bake and we run out of brown sugar and we run out of everything so fast. And it's because we taught me the importance of having those in the freezer at all times. And I need to be sure that they're always sitting around for if someone comes over or if I just feel the need to eat a cookie. When I made Aliyah a year ago, the hardest part for me, aside from my parents, my siblings, and the boys, the hardest part for me was leaving us and Bobby, especially after spending a whole year with you when you were in the house of all those things. But whether it was a coincidence or not, over the last year, every time I face my new Bobby, whenever Bobby would, would ask me where I lived or tell you that I lived in his or her eyes would open wide. And I knew deep down that was me telling me that you were proud of me, even though I wasn't here. I loved you. And I was so many miles away. I knew that you were proud of me. The way that I would be able to build in yourself. I know that for my life, you will be looking down upon for every success that I have, even for failure, because you're not really one to judge because you dropped out of college. <laughs> but you really will look down upon me. I hope you forgive me for breaking your bike. I'm not very I love you so much. I love you so much. It's scary. I know there are a lot of people who spoke today, so I'll uh, keep this short and uh, try to keep it unique. Uh, I basically grew up in Bobby and Zadie's house, um, but there are two specific areas in life where Zadie was always present. Growing up uh, during Davani and after school and camp, uh, during Davani, every morning, we were with Kumar. Zadie would sit behind me and would always have fun with me, whether it was poking me lovingly, uh, pointing me as a scrap to give a dog to dunk every morning, and burning my shell with a lump without fail every morning. Well, we're just saying well to the dominant times, which I was morning. Um, also, the privilege to sit in between my baby and my father, um, from the last Esther, and the morning was special. Uh, after school, I camp. I always end up at the Mizzi's house, but it was 
Hi, good morning, Jose. I'm Andre Sudugo. We're just talking about the sports teams in town. Um, here's a moment that I will never forget. And uh, well, I just cherish the unique experiences we had. Glenn Farber. I was privileged to be able to sit down every week here at Carrigan to learn comedy, study together for almost a quarter of a century. And you, you get to know someone in a whole different way when you're interacting that way as, as a public I, I'm grateful to Jerry, first of all, for agreeing to learn with me to begin with. Um, he surely could have learned more from someone who had a stronger background than I. And I guess that was the beginning of my learning about him was, was emblematic of the, uh, his generosity and his kindness. I learned an awful lot from him, not only in text, but about dedication and commitment to learning. And, and I really appreciate his patience, his guidance, and, and the Torah that he transmitted. There's one topic that he and I actually never studied together, but I had been thinking about, and that is the, the disconnect between the different uses and understandings of the, the word Tom. Um, we're accustomed to the way that the word is used in the uh, Pesach Haggadah, where it's applied to one of the, the Arba Bani, the four children. Um, and it's often translated, it's ambiguous, but often translated as being simple perhaps, or, or even naive. But that's probably not the meaning of the Samash intends when it uses the word in several places. For example, in Bereshit, Hashem instructs Avram to to, to walk in my ways before me um, and, and to be tamim. Since the word is ambiguous, Rashi clarifies it as meaning be wholehearted, um, be whole. Rashid also refers to Yaakov Avinu as an Ishtam. And Rashi again there explains the meaning of the word as someone whose libo came pi, whose heart is synchronous with his mouth. That is, he didn't say one thing while actually meaning another thing. <laughs> he explains the Ishtam as a person who she'ena harif l'ramot, one who is not sharp or shrewd at speaking deceptively. Yeah. And I bring this up because it, it, it was striking to me when we, an unfortunate side effect of working in a very political town is dealing with people who have a couple of character traits. One is an overinflated sense of self-importance and another is a continual jockeying for advantage <laughs> over others. These individuals often use speech as a tactic for advancement. They often speak deceptively, saying one thing, but really meaning another. Uh, in this town, you often meet people who have a, a hidden agenda and deal with people in a, a manipulative fashion. The last time I the Jerry Garrigan exemplified the Torah value of this midah that we're talking about, the characteristic of Tamimut. He did not put on airs, did not put on a show, did not try to deceive you with words. I never knew him to be anything close to 
hypocritical. There's a man who is Tom, who presents as he really is and, and not in this form, some people use that as an excuse, say, this is just who I am, I have to accept behavior that I use. Um, because who he is was an honest and good and upright person uh, who was never hiding anything and a moral character. Yashar, upright, is, is a term often associated with Tom and that, that really described Jerry Carrigan. One more example, the Gemara in Yoma discusses the construction of the Ara on the Ark in the Mishkan which should be covered both on the outside and on the inside with, with gold, with gilt uh, lining. And the Talmud builds off this architectural description to derive a prescription for human behavior. It tells us that a person should be toho kboro. One's inside should be just as his outside, in other words, be a man of sincerity and, and a man of integrity. The world did not need less of Gary Carrigan. The, more, the world needs more of him and, and people like him. And I hope it's On behalf of a great formation, I'd like to present you with this flag in honor of your husband's faithful service to this country. He's rising in a wall. A wall, you're out, Hamim, Shokhein, Babrohim, Ham Sam, Lufrakono, Panfea, Shino. The <laughs> Includes this portion of the service. Burial will be in Baltimore. Uh, in a moment, we'll squirt Dr. Terrigan out, bring him into the hearse. People can follow by foot the hearse up to the top of the hill. Then the hearse will wait, and those going out to the cemetery in Baltimore are invited to line up in cars behind the hearse. Uh, Shiva will be held at the Terrigan home on Kempo Drive. Uh, one specific request is Arab Shabbos. It's a long trip to the cemetery. People are pleased they ask to allow the family to get into the cars uh, promptly after the service is done so that they can proceed in a timely manner to the cemetery. The so followers will please come forward. Ladies and gentlemen, and if we would keep in mind, please follow as closely as it's safely possible. It's going to be torrential rain. I have a report from Baltimore already. So.